My name is Sadie Urban. I'm the events coordinator here at the Reserve. Um, thank you for coming out tonight for this talk, which is part of a year-long lecture series called the Ralph Newsom Lecture Series. It's funded in part by the Kickapoo Reforestation Fund, also known as the Newsom Grant, and the Friends of the KBR also helped out with the refreshments out in the lobby. So tonight we have Gene Jacobs here. He's a raptor biologist, and he's here to talk about snowy owl. And I understand he also brought a feather friend. Oh, wow. So I will pass it on to Jean. Um, I just wanted to thank Sadie for inviting me to come speak here tonight. It's my pleasure just to come and uh, share with you some of my uh, activities, research, and encounters. Uh, first, we're going to have a little overview of what you can expect tonight, what we're going to cover. Uh, a little bit of background about myself and our research station. Uh, we're going to go through a little bit, uh, a couple slides on ID, snowy owls, and potentially sexing them from the field. Uh, we'll go through some of their winter habits, where you're likely to find them this time of year. Uh, what causes the eruptions? They're a very uh, eruptive species. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the Project Snowstorm. It's a, um, a group of people got together and decided two years ago to um, conduct some intensive research on some of these major eruptions that are coming through the state and eastern United States. <coughs> and then some of the results from our telemetry studies. And some airport issues. And I'll be happy to take questions after that. And then we have Sassy, our education great horned owl, who will introduce you to. <laughs> so I got started at a very young age with raptors. I grew up in Green Bay. Um, currently, and now I teach a raptor workshop class accredited through UW Stevens Point. It's a hands on field techniques class. People of all ages and, and careers attend. It's accredited, so for continuing education, it's that applies. But many people are retired and they're interested in just um, coming out to the class to get some hands-on exposure to the different techniques used to study raptors. Some of those techniques we cover include working with mist nets. Uh, some of the students here are helping uh, set up nets. The students get hands-on experience extracting birds from nets. Um, and each fall session we visit a raptor banding station uh, where, the, where the, hawk, the birds are on uh, migration at that time. And so we can see many, many red tails in a short period of time. And this is one of the classes we are fortunate to have some good luck with the banding and most of them had a chance to hold one for the picture here. The classes are limited to eight students per class, and they're, each class is a 40, uh, 40 hours long, five days in a row, and um, if anyone's interested in anything specifically, more details about the class, of course, you can, um, my business cards are on the desk out here by the entrance door, and, you, and on the back side is the website address, you can check it out if you're interested. During the rest of the year, mostly summer and spring, I uh, work as a raptor consultant, and I generally work for utility companies who need to make updates or improvements on some of the pipelines or transmission lines or highways or bridges. And in order to do that, they have to fulfill the requirements the DNR requ requires them to have uh, wherever there's a likelihood of some endangered or threatened birds um, have surveys done, and that's what I do during spring and summer months. So the snowy owl is Wisconsin's largest owl by mass. Uh, it stands about two and a half feet, about two feet tall. Uh, slightly larger than the great horned owl. And uh, they have a white face, yellow eyes, no ear tufts. Um, and most of them are barred on the, the chest and on the back with some dark markings and on the top of the head. In flight and viewing from underneath, 
they can look white, uh, especially with the sun shining and reflecting off the snow. It's really well um, lit on the underside, so they look very, very white. Um, but most of them have some markings on the shoulders and backs uh, to help them camouflage it. <coughs> this one isn't watching where she's driving. <laughs> watching where she came from. Uh, one way to uh, commonly um, method to uh, sex the individuals is through their plumage and size. Um, the most, like most raptors, snowy owls exhibit RSD, reverse size dimorphism. In most birds, the, the uh, male is larger than the female, but in raptors, it's the reverse of that. The females are larger, and in the snowy owl's case, about the females are about 20 to 30 percent larger than the males. So. Sometimes out in the wild, it isn't the easiest to notice that size difference, but when you get them in hand, it's much easier, um, especially after you take some measurements. Generally speaking, the males tend to be whiter, fewer barring on, on feathers on their back and on their chest, and in, uh, whereas the females usually are more heavily barred. But in this case here, these, both these birds look pretty similar. The males got a little bit more white on the head, um, and you can see he look, it's hard to tell size, but he is a little, he's a little smaller. And so we got the male on the left, the female on the right. Uh, so it is pretty easy to be confused in the field. In the hand, it's much easier. Uh, again, the barring on the back looks similar, both to the male and female. But one of the biggest <laughs> clues that we provide is the... Right in here on the primaries, the, the snowy owl has only one or two dark bands coming across all the primary feathers. That's the male, he's whiter, and the female down here has a lot more. She has four or five uh, rows of bands or bars on her wings. So that's, that's usually the, uh, a really quick telltale clue for us once we catch the bird. If we're having trouble dis deciding on the sex. As you can see here, the male on the left, uh, nearly white, it's his whole underside is pure, almost, I think, completely white, with just a little bit of barring on the, the back shoulders of the wings. And uh, the bird on the right, um, you can see much more heavily barred, and so that's the female. And another way I can tell for sure that this, the bird on the right is a female is down below here it says female. <laughs> uh, their wi winter habitat consists primarily of spending their time in open country. Uh, they usually aren't too close to any <coughs> forested tracks. It's usually big extensive forested areas, not just a couple open fields. So when you have my square miles together in chunks of the state, then that's when you usually get a little bit more um, um, kind of concentration of the birds in more open country. They, uh, they perch oftentimes on low structures like fence posts, um, any other type of irrigation lines or machinery that farmers have in the fields. And uh, sometimes right on, well, oftentimes right on the ground or on the snow. Um, <clears throat> overcast days, the birds are much more active in their activities than they are on sunny days. They're classified as a diurnal raptor, but for the most part, on bright sunny days, the snowies are pretty inactive. Um, you'll see them sitting low, usually on fence posts or on the ground. And they may sit there for nearly all day, four or five hours of bright sunlight, they don't move. But then once it gets a little later in the afternoon, like three o'clock, then they start becoming more active. And you'll see them oftentimes fly up to higher perches. And that enables them to um, observe a bigger area and do foraging 
through their vision, they can detect where the preys are, the, the mice are running in. Um, I forgot to mention they feed primarily on small to medium sized mammals and small to medium sized or large sized sometimes uh, birds. Now the mammals, I'd say rabbits are about the limits of their um, capabilities. They are very big and powerful. A rabbit's pretty heavy for them, to, a full grown rabbit's pretty heavy for them to fly off with sometimes they can't quite get, get airborne. <coughs> Uh, now this was a recent update of the snowy owls observed uh, during from October through February of this year, this winter. And this is the number of snowy owls and the locations where they can be found. Now you can you can see certain areas have um, some concentrations of snowy owls. They do like a lot of the Fox Valley and Green Bay South through the Appleton and Kakana, along those lakes, Lake Onabago, and down to Milwaukee. Uh, so you got a lot of open country and you got a lot of frozen shorelines. And so a lot of times during the day, the birds will fly out on the lake shore. Um, they might be out a mile or so out in the middle of nowhere, and they don't really expect to do any foraging at that time. They're more or less roosting or napping. And then once it starts to get dark, you'll see them fly in from, from the lakes. Um, even like on Lake Winnebago, oftentimes they'll be sitting out in the middle of the ice. It's just uh, kind of an unusual place. You, you wouldn't think they just sit there. Um, and this, this eBird is, uh, is handy for you to, to look up if you're trying to find some individuals or some species that uh, should be here, but you just don't know where to look, or you haven't found them when you've looked for them, you can zoom in on these maps and it'll give you a more pinpoint accuracy of where the birds, individuals, were spotted and on what date. So it's really a helpful tool for us biologists when we need to look up something and we have some real current information, not waiting for reports to come out and having the data be a year old. So what causes these snowy owls to erupt, or populations to erupt? <coughs> um, for the most part, it's, it's, it's directly related to the lemming population. The lemmings are small mammals that they feed on primarily uh, up in the Arctic. And that's their main staple food supply during the breeding season. So on years and the, and the lemming population is very cyclical. So and it's on about a four year, sometimes five year cycle. So the snowy owls population tends to follow that. On years when the lemmings are abundant, the snowy owls um, congregate and they're very, they're somewhat, they're very nomadic in their identifying their territory each year. They don't return specifically to the same spot like many other birds and a lot of the raptors I deal with, like the red-shouldered hawks, they generally come to the same 40 or 80 acre area um, and to nest each year. But the snowy owl, where the food supply is the greatest, that's where they're going to congregate. If they come back to the, to the Arctic where they nested the previous year and the lemming population has dropped dramatically, most likely many of those birds are going to until they can find a stable population or a good population of lemmings. If they can't, then some years they may not even nest. But a lot of that we don't really know. We know it probably exists, but they may not nest, but we don't know how frequently and what degree do these birds move each year to try and follow where there's a higher lemming population. So that's a big part of what um, needs to be studied in greater detail. Uh, here's a, uh, a snowy owl nest on a year that there was an extremely high lemming population. <laughs> so the male was, was having the heyday of his life. He could go out and catch lemmings faster than his wife could eat them. <laughs> and so he just kept bringing them in because he knew at some point when those little chicks 
uh, eggs hatch and the chicks grow up, they're going to start eating those really fast. <laughs> and so in the picture, this is, uh, this is from the Project Snowstorms website. Uh, I only could count about 45, <laughs> but I knew they were stacked up, and they said that 70 lemmings and 8 bulls in the picture. <laughs> and so on years, um, when there's a high lemming population like this, then the snowies can, can reproduce, they can and successfully fledge more of their chicks than normal, they may lay more eggs in those years, and so then the snowy owl population, the short term, the juvenile birds, is an explosion of snowy owls on those high bull years. And so what happens is once the, um, the sit fall season comes and the winter comes, and a lot of these juveniles, there is room for all these juvenile snowy owls. So it's believed that the juveniles are the primarily, in the early part of the cycle, the, the ones that come down um, head, heading south. And this last year, last three years have been, which is, I think, unprecedented, to have three years in a row of, of a high snowy owl population in Wisconsin for winter. And we're trying to figure out why that is, and, and some of this is kind of matching up with what we've been finding out. The first year of the popula of the snowy owl invasion or eruption was 2013 and 14. That winter, um, we caught six snowy owls, and all of them were juvenile birds. So that makes sense. The juveniles flew down early. Um, then last year, the population increased. The wintering population in Wisconsin got even higher. First year there was like 112 snowy owls documented in the state. Um, last winter was a 168, so there was a really a large number of snowies. And then this year, as of December 6, was 108. But I think the fair number more have moved in. I'll bet you it'll be around the 140 or something like that. So it's going to have two really big years at the end. And this past year. Um, I don't know what, uh, we haven't caught any snowy owls yet this year, so I'm not sure if we have a lot of adults or juveniles in the population at this time. Uh, now, Project Snowstorm, I mentioned earlier, it's a, it's a large group of people, started off by two guys, Dave Brinker, a, a guy from Wisconsin, and Scott Whitensall. They're both out east now, and they decided that it was a good time of the, a good chance for them to start up a research project like this. So they had a bunch of funding, and it's a telemetry study on these snowy owls. Um, the first year we placed 22 transmitters on snowy owls, and um, six or four of them were we, we put on in Wisconsin. And I'll kind of go through what we did in Wisconsin. The transmitters, if I can get to it, there. It's a little, <coughs> little square box on her back, and that black part is a solar panel, and it has a little battery in there, a very light battery, trying to keep this as, as lightweight as possible. Um, and it's got a GPS data logger in there, and every half hour it's recording their GPS coordinates. So it's a very precise um, location. It isn't, um, um, you know, it's, it's very re re resolved. Resolution is great on that. So that's very helpful. You can really tell what the bird is doing and where it is. Uh, it's, it's programmed to take a reading every half, or yeah, every half hour. So every day it's, it's saving 48 locations on each bird. And then once a week, connect with a cell phone tower and so it can download the data to the cell phone tower. Now for birds that stay in the U.S. like let's say red-tailed hawks or red-shouldered hawks where there's lots of cell phone towers that works pretty good. It doesn't work the best for the snowy owl because in, when spring comes they take off and they get up into Canada and there's not much connection up there. <laughs> 
So, but the loggers keep recording every, as long as it's getting enough sunlight to recharge the battery, it keeps recording all these locations, and so it will include up to several years worth of locations until it, if it ever does come back down south enough to get to a cell phone tower, then it will dump all that data. So it's a very um, surprising and happy moment when you get a bird to left and you didn't hear from him for six, seven months and all of a sudden he's back in the late fall. Uh, now, Buena Vista bird was one of the first birds that Project Snowstorm uh, put a transmitter on. It was our first bird that we, we tracked. And you can see this is after only about a week's worth of data. All the locations it was jumping around. And between the two white, uh, two white roads, that, that line is a white road, is a road, and over here is another road. That's one mile apart. And so the bird stayed within about a square mile during that week. And um, it's kind of interesting, I just wanted to point that out. I, I thought that if someone asked me what I thought, I would have guessed about a square mile because larger raptors, oftentimes their home range is in that ballpark. So um, this bird um, hung around in the marsh the whole winter. And it moved around a little bit. It moved to a new location a mile or two further south of the Vista. It stayed there for a few weeks. And then it took off north. And we didn't hear from it. All, uh, let's see, that was in the winter, uh, March of 2014. It left. And we didn't hear from it until just recently. So there's a whole year it was up, up north and came south some, to some level, but never came within cell phone range. And then went back north again, probably the, that summer. And then now this fall, when it came down, we got a connection. And what a shock it was. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, we did, it only made one connection. And it was so much data, it, it, didn't, it has a time frame of when it's going it, to uh, calls and then and it's a certain amount of time, and then it cuts off. And then the next time it connects, it'll finish up what it missed or as much as it can when it's got that many, that many locations. Well, we only got one connection uh, in no, on November 7th when it connected in Winnipeg. Uh, <laughs> it still was up north a ways, but it was where a cell phone tower was. And so we got one, and I'll show you the slide. Now this is from, we didn't know this data on the next two slides until just um, this year, this winter. So after it left us in Wisconsin, it flew up north of Winnipeg um, on the way up, stopped there for a while, it looks like. And a lot of times the birds, they don't, um, like this distance from here to there was about 500 miles. It took her about 30 days, for him, 30 days to go there. But he doesn't, and that comes out to like, I think it was 20, 28 miles or something a day. But they don't go 28 miles a day, you know, they'll be... Uh, kind of get a little territory temporary for a week or sometimes a few days and then all of a sudden then they'll fly a couple hundred miles and then they'll sit again. So it's, uh, and that, that's why we're kind of missing some data there telling how much and when did they actually move and when did they sit. But this is the route she took, or he took. And then from there, it continued up, way up into above the Arctic Circle. And, um, total distance from Buena Vista up there is 1,700 miles. And that last leg, she left around May, um, April 1st, no, May, May 1st, uh, from the, the middle dot, and they went up the last uh, 1,200 miles, and uh, that took one month. So it was about 40 miles a day, average. So it went a little faster. But now we can tell, this was a male, and based on when they zoomed in, in the area where he's, his location is, you get a real fine resolution like we had on the other map. And we could see he's moving around by a lot. Those, the distances between those two, two, two blue dot, or red dots below him, I think was about 40, 50 miles. 
So he's moving around up there. It's not likely he's a breeder. And uh, that's, it's reasonable because he was a, a young juvenile when he, he came down here when we caught him. So that's not surprising he's not uh, breeding. And he's probably looking for high hope, high lemming populations. Because if, if a male can, can secure a territory where there's lots of food, he probably is really going to be successful in securing a mate because he'll bring her lots of food and she figures that out uh, real quickly after the first few days if he's not bringing food in, uh, not even enough to keep her going, he's a deadbeat guy. <laughs> okay, we had another owl in Kiwani. Um, we banded this one in uh, about the middle of the winter. And it spent most of the time, almost the whole winter, right in Kiwani, in the area of Kiwani. And then in the spring, right when I thought it was going to head north, it goes south 10 or 20 miles down to Manitowoc and spends a week or two down there. And then it proceeded to go up to uh, Green Bay. It was going kind of slow. Then it got up here to um, Upper Michigan. And then I thought, well, uh, now the next time it checks in, it's going to we may not get another check-in because it's going to be above the cell phone towers again. Well, no, he decides I'm not ready to go yet. He comes back and he goes over to Door County and uh, does some uh, flying around the whole Door County, heading back to Green Bay and off the shore. And then he takes off and goes up a little bit more to Escanaba and sat there for a few days. And then we lost them. And that one we haven't heard from since. Um, the birds could be, <clears throat> they could have died by now, but they could be doing fine. Um, the transmitter could be the problem, or the, the, chance, the, the fact that it's not within cell phone range could be the other problem. Um, our Marshfield bird, this one was pretty. I guess typical of what you'd expect, nothing unusual. We caught it down near Marshfield, where the dot starts down at the, to the right, lower right. And then it uh, moved up over to a Eau Claire area, stayed there for a long time, about three weeks, then moved to another level. So you can see how it's all that, those red dots and blue dots, that's where it's, it's the whole area is cluttered with lines and dots, and it turns into a big... Uh, dot instead of lines. But then it spent uh, some time up north of Minneapolis and then it moved up further and then we lost it there. And it was kind of funny when you, you zoom in on the exact location on Google Maps you just keep zooming in and all of a sudden you see and you see this bird is sitting in the middle of this lake. Because <laughs> on the map it shows it as a lake but you're not, you know, I'll are, but at first I was thinking, what's he doing in the water? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's not water now. <laughs> He's on the ice. <laughs> well, it kind of throws you for a wrench for a second. I, I thought there was a malfunction in the equipment or something. Uh, so that's where we lost that one. Now a couple of interesting uh, other from some of Project Snowstorm's other birds that were wired. Um, the, the map to the left shows two different adult female birds. This was in Upper Michigan, uh, up near Whitefish Point. And these two birds were on adjacent territories. And based on the size of these, all these dots, this is after several weeks or maybe months uh, of locations, the green bird stayed there for the most part and the red bird stayed where she was. And this is a very tight, that, that square from there down to here, oops, down to there is a quarter mile. Mm -hmm. So it's a 40, it's only 40 acres square. Mm -hmm. So, and then it goes up to the next 40. So they really aren't using much area in these territories here compared to the new system who took a whole square mile, which is eight times bigger than this 80 acres. And this, uh, the bird right next to it 
seems to have done about the same thing. Now, the only thing I can guess on this was, two things are probably what's making these two stay so close and stay where they are, is that there must be a high small mammal population or, or bird population. Um, they're, but they're probably feeding mostly on metal poles. Uh, but they do feed on other birds. They could feed on pheasants, prairie chickens. Um, in Buena Vista, I think the, the managers of the, the wildlife area there are concerned that the snowy owls may be eating too many prairie chickens. But, uh, but I think from the pellets we collected on that, on some of the snowy owls down in Buena Vista, it was all small mammals, all holes. Um, so they must have a high food supply for those birds to be able to sit in a small area and still get all the food they, they need. The other thing is, since there's more than one snowy owl there, all of a sudden I think they all kind of, in order for everyone to fit, then they're, they're jockeying for position and, and defending their territory. And, and so the fact that this other snowy owl is right next to that one, makes me think that there probably were several others. And I think the, the researchers who trapped these birds said there was about seven or eight snowy owls in that area. So they had to be pretty tight. And I mean, if the other bird, the green bird, wasn't there, I think the red bird would just naturally expand out a little bit. But <clears throat> So that's why I think it's, they have such a small territory there, two things. Now, in this other, uh, this is over on Lake Erie, um, this bird was. All right, go. This bird was. Um, we landed over here on the shore, and um, they studied it to watch its locations a few times. And it would go out on the ice and sit out there during the day, and come back in the forage for a few days. And then all of a sudden, they noticed, hey. It's, it's not coming on the shore, it's getting out on the lake for day after day after day. I think it was over a week. The bird, what is he doing out there? Why is he starting? Is he dead? What's going on? There's no mice out there. And then finally someone thought, you know, I don't think the lake is frozen solid. I think there's open channels and sloughs of water in there. So you look at the satellite imagery, Oh yeah, there's fair amount of water. Oh, maybe there's lots of ducks out there sleeping in the water at night, making it very easy for him to catch because if they're sleeping, they're not even going to move. So he was out there for several weeks. Yeah. <laughs> so he had uh, those those ducks were just sitting ducks. <laughs> But, uh, and it's kind of interesting to watch uh, some of the behaviors of the, like the, if you ever watched or saw a bald eagle come in and, and catch a, a, a dead fish or a fish on the, show, on the surface, he flies, drops off from his perch and he drops down really low and he's just skimming the water and when he gets to where the fish is, he just caves them and he barely gets his foot wet and he just keeps flying. And... Whereas the osprey does the complete opposite. He goes from straight up to straight down, basically, and he goes down under the water completely many times, so he gets really wet. But the snowy owl, that's the last thing he wants to do is grab onto this duck and fall into the water. So even when it's hunting mice, uh, when I've watched it, a lot of times they fly in low and they just come skimming over the snow and they, they reach down and they grab something. And he, what did he do? But he keeps flying. He doesn't land either a lot of times. He and then he'll go up to a perch, and then you'll see him, and he eats his mouse. So that stands to reason, yeah, they could do that to the ducks, because they could catch them. And they, got, they can't be great big ducks, though. <laughs> they have to be some of the smaller ducks that they're able to hit them, grab them, and keep flying, and not lose uh, momentum and fall into the water, because they don't want to go in the water, that's for sure. So that was some of the interesting stuff that they did on the, what they found out, just we just learned at least a couple of these things uh, about our bird in detail. And out of those 22 that we tracked, that they put transmitters on, I think it was six of them uh, last year 
came back and reported in. Um, none of mine did last year, but one of mine did this year from two years back. And then a second one of mine from two years back uh, was found and caught by a researcher in Duluth. So it came back pretty close to the same area, um, still off by a couple hundred miles. Okay. Um, so the question that sometimes comes up, are snowy owls starving? Well, yeah, I suppose. In, in nature, there's all kinds of animals are starving for some odd reason or another. And when there's an eruptive uh, cycle and the, the population has crashed and they don't have food or much food, then they come south. And on that first wave in October, we had... Um, this year started out really strange as well. I never expected it to continue to be another banner year for snowy owls. And it wasn't, it was like the later part of October, snowy owls started showing up all over the state. And there was, I think it was 65 or some odd number of them in this early wave when most snowy owls don't show up here till late November, December. These, this whole wave came in really early. And, um, Many of those birds turned up at rehab centers of uh, emaciated birds. Uh, some were able to be uh, <coughs> rejuvenated and released, and some didn't make it. Um, but this bird, we had him, he was a, the bird we, um, I'm going to talk about him in a little more detail, but he ended up, uh, just before we released him, I had some mice, I thought, well, see if he's hungry. I put a mouse by him on, he just grabbed it right out of my hand. <laughs> After three, four mice, he was full. Um, okay, this, uh, now airport issues. Now, we've talked about how the snowy owl likes to visit big, massive, open areas where there's lots of fields and grasslands. That's typically what you have around airports. And Last winter, I got a call from the Mosinee Central Wisconsin Airport, and they were having snowy owls on the airstrip, sitting on the airstrip, or sitting on, this isn't from that airport, but this is one of the airport pictures, I did some other work as well. Um, this one, the, the snowy owl was sitting on the runway signs. And <clears throat> so the airport officials were really nervous that if, if one of those jets comes in and would hit the snowy owl, five pound snowy owl, it could take the plane down. Not to say what it would do to the owl, of course. <laughs> so it's, it's a bad situation for both the owl and the humans who are using those airstrips. So um, we got a permit, or they, we, we ended up cooperating with, uh, with them and the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service issued a permit to us to allow us to capture and relocate the owl to a safe location. <coughs> and generally speaking, when we're when we're doing our research, we capture the bird, we release it at the site we caught it at. We're not allowed to move it anything more than a short distance for any reason. So we had to get a special permit to move the bird down to Goose Pond. So this is the bird, um, well this isn't, but that's the bird that we moved from Central Wisconsin Airport down to Goose Pond, and it was released down there. And then it spent the rest of the winter down there in that Goose Pond area. So that was a happy, I guess, ending to the, um, the bird and the airport as well. <coughs> And that's, this is Mark Martin, uh, the project, or the refuge manager, uh, releasing the bird. You can see the habitat out there, pretty much a bunch of nothing. Agricultural fields, corn fields, um, very desolate, really. And this was the, me releasing the Buena Vista bird two and a half years ago, about two years ago.
So, are there any questions? Yeah. Um, when you have to try to capture it at an airport, how do you do it? Well, we're, we're burdened with security on us all the time. <laughs> um, and it was, luckily it was a small air, central Wisconsin, not a very big airport. But there is some commercial jetliners coming in through there, a couple of different uh, firms. Um, so I had to, every time I wanted to come there, I had to call the project manager, the maintenance manager, and then he designated one or two of their crew to come out and they would either ride along with us or follow us in their vehicle and um, we'd work out a plan where we wanted to go and where the birds were and, and then we'd set up traps to catch the birds. Um, it was best when they weren't in the main runway area. A lot of times they were in areas just off to the side where there's taxiing and stuff like that. It wasn't such an issue, but um, one of the, well, this one bird that was out there was a problem because she always wanted to sit in the middle of the whole airport. And she had two or three <laughs> other snowies around, and whenever they would go catch some food, she'd go over and harass them. <laughs> so we ended up um, having to, it was, usually we're trapping in the late afternoon and then into dark, sometimes 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock at night, where it's hard to see anything. Um, but your eyes get used to it, and if once you've been out enough, if you look at something just to the side of the bird, let's say the trap, because you want to see if the owl came to the trap, then it's amazing. You can see a little better when you look off to the side, but pay attention to what's just a couple feet to the end here. Your eye is a funny, I'm not sure how it actually functions, but you have better light gathering sensors when you look off the side than you do right in the center. So um, that's how we, we had to deal with security and um, but the, when we trapped it was sometimes it was handy because they had some big lights right around the the the, the run of the taxi or the dock um, gates by the gates and then the light would spread so you could still see the traps kind of easy if we have them set kind of within view of that, that was handy. Yeah? Is there a chance of getting any snowy owls on the satellite? <laughs> um, this year? Well, I was just wondering, you know, if you wouldn't have to depend on the owls. Oh, on the satellite, yes. Um, it, it was a judgment call when, when the Project Snowstorm met with the different uh, satellite companies. I think this was substantially cheaper using cell phone connections rather than satellite. Um, but I kind of like the satellite better because every time it's pretty predictable you're going to get more data on the bird every week or whatever you have it programmed to do. Whereas this, you can go months and a year or for two years, and you've already thought they must be dead, or they must have gotten it off, or they must they must be broken, and then all of a sudden it comes in. So, um, but they was these were quite a bit cheaper. The satellite transmitters run, I think, forty five hundred to five thousand, where these were three thousand. Yeah. Uh, what's your sense of the intelligence of snowy owls, or okay, would you compare it to other owls or other raptors, or, or um, sociability? You know? The owls, generally speaking, are not as wise as they look. <laughs> <laughs> they have a pretty small brain. Yeah. Um, but most raptors, and birds for that matter, uh, experience a lot of different birds trying to capture them. They're pretty smart. It's hard to trick them more than once. It's, it's a lot easier the first time, or a juvenile bird who, who isn't experienced and he's a little more gutsy to try something. The adult birds, we still catch some, but the, you got to try harder. You got to try different tricks. Um, it's, um, but overall, um, I think a lot of the birds. The owls, I think owls have a, compared to some birds, they have a smaller brain than many of the birds. Because
because they have a part of it is the reason that their eyes are so big, it consumes such a big part of their skull, there isn't room for a very big brain. <laughs> yeah? Do owls uh, have plumage faces like some other like hawks? I got to think a long time here because I learned there's two words you must always remember never to use. It's always never. <laughs> um, I don't think there's any phases or morphs is the, is the new term. Um, for the hawk, for the owls that are, you know, different uh, colorations. Mm -hmm. There's, um, I think, some. S oh, yeah, screech owls. Who yeah. said that? Screech owls. Yeah, screech owls. There's the gray morph, the red, <coughs> and then the brown. Mm -hmm. It's kind of in between the two, but um, yes, that was good. I didn't think of the screech. That's what I was trying to think, but I didn't think good enough. <laughs> yeah. I think um, the only stress in with regard to breeding, or the main stress I would say that they're going to encounter is lack of food. And if it's an abundance year, I would say then you might, I think you would have a higher, if females breed their first year, then I would say that would be the year, to me most likely that would be the breeding bird. I still think the male would not be a breeder. How do you think climate change will affect their behavior or migration? Well, <clears throat> I think it's going to be a secondary effect um, because it's going. To, I think that's going to be the most immediate action. If if this um, climate change affects the lemmings, then I think it's going to have a quick effect on the snowing. But if the food supply was stable during this climate change, then we're going to, I think it's going to take longer to show up. Probably I won't see it. Hopefully I won't. Um, if it's bad, I don't want to see bad. <laughs> but um, so, but if, otherwise, if it was going to show up in the snowies, it would have to, I think, the quickest way would be through the lemmings or through anything that's directly connected to reproduction. Aren't as aggressive, um, but they 
they come in fast and hit the net. So in my class, we, uh, in this Raptor workshop, all the students who take the class, this is one of the exercises we do. They get a chance to work with an education bird. Now this bird, when we were doing research on raptors, we don't ever wear gloves to protect our hands. You notice that taking that Cooper's hawk out of the net, we didn't, we weren't wearing a glove on that one slide because gloves are just useless. They, you can't take a, you, you uh, untangle a bird wearing big gloves. So you just have to be careful how you handle them and where you grab. And you can safely grab them uh, without a glove. <clears throat> but Sassy, she sits on our hand. The raptors, we hold their legs and then to do measurements and stuff so that they aren't free to leave. But Sassy's tethered on, on my glove. And so we have to rely on her to perch. Come on. Carpeting, we want to kind of protect the floor for cleanups. <laughs> so I'm just going to spread this out. Should have done this before I got it out. droops and her left leg has an injury and it uh, when it was healing the joint calcified up somewhat so she's got limited use in her gripping power <coughs> and limited flight but I think she could fly around in here <laughs> which we won't try no <laughs> I'd say this one weighs 1,500 grams. The snowies go 13, the males, the little males are 1,300 up to about 1,700 grams. And then the female snowies go about 18 to 2,500 grams. So she's about the size of a male snowy. She falls right in that group. What's her wingspan? About three and a half feet. Is she fully grown now? Yeah. She, actually, when she left the nest, and this is true of nearly all birds, except maybe turkeys and a few game species, when they leave the nest, within a week or two, they're full grown. Her feathers are as big, and she's as big as she's going to get. So at many times, we, when we catch, take the birds in the nest, and we, we band the chicks, we weigh them, and those birds are oftentimes weigh more than the adult parents we caught. So, where does she reside? She, she has an out, outdoor mew at our house, a cage. And it's well protected, but has some um, kind of decked in area where she can see outside. And that's where she sits. I can tell she sits on this couple perches, mostly by how much whitewash is below. <laughs> And she likes to sit and look out the window, even when it's cold out. <laughs> She's looking at you. Yeah. yeah. She's moving her throat? What is that? You know, her, her it's neck. called a guller flutter. She's, she's doing that for two reasons. They, birds, like dogs, to control their body temperature, they pant. 
So that's what she's doing. She's breathing fast. And probably with all these people, she's a little nervous, so that makes her pant a little more. She's, she works real well. With, it's, um, I use her with the classes. All the students get to, and we transfer her from one person to school to the next. And um, she sits really good. But, and you notice when I went to her by the cage, she had the attitude problem. <laughs> she was snapping and hissing at me, but within a minute, she settles right down. But that's how she got her name, Sassy. <laughs> how endangered are they? Great horns? Yeah. Or even snowies, I think, are on a list of um, concern. Because uh, I, I don't know the data to support it, but I, I just read that it was kind of a uh, was listed by some bird organizations. Great horns are across all of most all of North America. You find them in close to the Arctic, and you find them in the desert, and you find them everywhere. There's a lot of them um, because they're very. They're, they're very adaptable to all these different habitat types. They can kill almost anything. Skunks, you know, rabbits, mice, weasels, pigeons, ducks. It just goes on. And that's why all the birds don't like them. <laughs> what, are the what, what size territory do they have, just curiosity? Is that great? About a square mile. Is I've had one in my woods that I hear almost every night for the last six years. Yeah. Out there pretty much daily in the same place. Yeah, you can hear it. I think he's probably uh, the nest area might fluctuate a little bit depending on where the the, the great uh, probably a red-tailed hawk nest is what it's using, but it could use a crow nest or a squirrel nest. Mm -hmm. And so it might. Well, turn around. How do you see her? I see her with. Uh, um, we put in just dead food in there for her. She feeds on, and that's not unusual for them to eat dead food. Um, at first I thought, well, they hardly ever going to eat dead food. Well, that's not true. Uh, once they pair up, the male brings her dead food all the time. He puts it in just like the lemmings, all those dead mice, those dead lemmings are on it. And uh, one, of the, one of the groups, someone said, well, those things are going to rot. Well, two things. That's up in the Arctic. It doesn't get that hot up there. Always. <laughs> and another thing is, is the owls have their stomach juices, digestive tracts a lot more stronger than ours is, and they can handle uh, if, thing is, if things are starting to decay a little. Yeah? Uh, I'm, I'm just amazed at that with birds that are ground nesters. Can you talk a little bit about what their behavior is protecting the nest and feeding and I mean, I just always picture birds in the tree. Yeah. Imagine them on the ground. Well, the, the one I have experience with uh, somewhat is the short-eared owl in Wisconsin. They're a ground nester. Um, we did some video camera work with them, and this is out near Buena Vista grasslands, and there's a lot of crop dusters out there. And the birds reacted quite a bit to the crop duster, because he's flying kind of low. He's not flying over them. But they, they loop around it throughout the area. Uh, so anytime a big bird or plane flies over, they just freeze. They don't move. Um, they're, they're always concerned about um, ground predators. They, they're really vulnerable to that. Where these other birds that are up in a tree, uh, they have an advantage, I think. Um, I don't know what else to tell you. So how, how do they protect, how, how long is the bird in the nest? Oh, most, most raptors, the eggs hatch in about 30 to 45 days, the bigger birds. Oh. Yeah. So the female's sitting on the eggs for a month? Yeah, over a month. The, the smaller species are a month. Screech and Sawwits are about a month incubation. So how long does she sit, like in a day, how long she's sitting on oh. the eggs? almost every second. She'll get up, she'll roll the eggs, she'll sit down again. Um, where the time she'll actually leave the nest is when the male comes back with food for her. Mm -hmm. Then she'll go feed, take 
go potty break and come back. She took one of my fire. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> she says, ah, he's off from the mat. I'm going to go. <laughs> Got to stay here. <laughs> well, now she's done, so I don't have to worry. I can walk down the aisles a little bit. Yeah. Um, would she be able to survive in the wild if you were to let her go? Or no, she, she's classified as a non-releasable owl for two reasons. Her, her, she uh, has limited flight uh, up to 50 feet. So she can only fly about 50 feet. Um, mm -hmm. And she doesn't have the strength in this foot. That's why I'm watching this foot. I, I think I can get away with it. <laughs> right, Sassy? <laughs> uh, and so she would have a hard time. I would say near impossible for her to live without starving to death when she can only fly this few feet. Yeah. Uh, and that's the only reason why we were able to get the permit to use and keep her. You have another permit? Yeah, another permit. I got a lot of permits each year, annual reports on all these permits. <laughs> <laughs> and some of them charge a fee to have the permit. <laughs> but um, yeah, she, it, uh, the, that's one of the stipulations is the bird must be a non-releasable bird. They don't want us to take one of the extra ones that we catch as, as, a, as, as a wild bird that could make it in the wild. What for when we have these birds that have disabilities and then they can do the same thing? It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Is this their mating season right now? Yeah. Because we've heard last, two of them talking. Last winter she had a boyfriend. <laughs> sitting outside her door. <laughs> hooting and hooting, come out and play, but she couldn't come out and play. <laughs> when we first got our place, we had uh, Craig Orange around, you could hear him. And then after a few years, for the last several years, about all we have is Bart. Yeah. Are they exclusive or is it just territorial you know I mean yeah the the, the great horn um, usually nests sooner and but the barred owl doesn't like him around if they if they um, see him around they will vocalize and try and harass him to leave <laughs> just like the hawks do um, but the, the great horn I don't think is too intimidated by them but if the uh, I would say it's more likely the reason the great horn's not there is because he moved first. I don't think it's be because the barred owl pushed him out. That's what I, I would guess. And it's probably because the nest that he was going to use or had used in the past years is not available anymore because once the red tails get done and then the next year the great horn, if the great horn uses it, these guys are big and heavy and they, they don't add sticks to fix it up. And they all they do is trample it down in the next year. What happened to that nice big nest? It's gone because these great horns were too rough on it. Yeah. What sort of interactions do the snowies have with other raptors when they come south? Where do they fall in the pecking order? They're at the top too, as well. I don't know. I've seen a a, a great horned owl perched when we were doing some trapping, and a snowy owl came, and he came and died in. in Tried it. Uh, it didn't hit it, but it swooped within a few inches of it, and it's kind of like the warning shot. <laughs> uh, so, I, I those two are pretty close in size, but I think the great the snowy is a little heavier. Um, might chase them all. Yeah. Do any owls share territory, or would their territories be small enough that they could seem to be? in the same place. We live in a, a small valley and every year it seems like we've got long-eared and barn owls in there talking and they're active through the whole breeding season. So could they be on this hillside, that hillside, sharing that territory or they, would that be the line and they've both got separate territories? It, it's probably most likely that they are um, sharing the home range, the territory size. I think the immediate area is what gets most of the individual or the pairs really ruffled up about 
being too close. But like a screech owl and a great horn, well, the screech owl is always nervous about the great horn because he's potential prey. Um, but he, will, um, he, you will find, you could find two or three screech owl territories within one great horn territory. But the bar and the long ear, would they get along in the similar um, next door or in the same territory? Is this during the winter? Well, or yeah, the nest winter year? and spring, it seems to be, it goes on for a long time. And it's every year. Because this, um, the wintering stuff, it's mostly, they're mostly concerned about the potential prey the other species might be consuming. Mm -hmm. Now, long ears prefer to forage out in the fields, uh, much like a harrier. Um, even though they roost in the, in the woods or conifer stands. And the, the barred owl probably is more of a hunter of the woods with some fields too, but not, they're, they're probably not quite competing so directly. Yeah. So what I'm thinking is going on about finding the nest is the long-eared owl seems to be roosting on a rocky pine tree covered area. There's no trees around, but that east slope and then to the east of that it's open fields and like the next valley has lots of open fields and on the west side of our valley seems to be the barn owls all the time and that's just a mile and a half or two miles of woods through the reserve you know there's nothing but woods okay so maybe i'm on the line and one's going one way and one's going the other yeah because i'll hear them all through the spring oh wow. that's pretty neat well, that might be a good place to stop. We probably shouldn't applaud, but um, I'd like to thank Jean for making the trip here. Um, thank you all for coming. And our next talk will be on March 9th. And Phil Pelletieri, um, he'll be here to talk about the tick population and um, information on transmitted diseases. So March 9th.